Well, I believe we are at six o'clock and uh, the uh, Midwesterner <laughs> and I and myself will, uh, I want to start on time. So I'm going to welcome everybody to the 2021 edition of the William T. and Virginia H. Ingram Lectures. We are delighted tonight to uh, welcome Dr. Valerie Bridgman uh, as our speaker. Uh, just to give people a little sense of how the evening will go, I'm going to do uh, an introduction of the lecture series. Then I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore, who's going to introduce our speaker. And then Dr. Bridgman will uh, give us her wisdom. And then we're going to have some time for discussion, um, which I'm really looking forward to. And we'll close out with prayer. The Holy Spirit has anointed uh, Dr. Woodbury Moore to do that prayer tonight. So uh, when she starts praying, we're done. Mm -hmm. So this lecture series is named for a family that is noted for their service to Jesus Christ in their lives and ministry. Established by the Reverend Dr. William T. Bill Ingram and his wife, Virginia, the Ingram lectures are made in honor of their parents, the Reverend and Mrs. W.T. Ingram Sr. and the Reverend and Mrs. J. Will Howell. Virginia Ingram served as many years uh, for many years as librarian, both in the Memphis public schools and at the University of Memphis. Her spirit of intellectual sharing, faith, and welcome for others was shared also by her husband, Bill. Bill Ingram guided Memphis Theological Seminary in its move from McKinsey, Tennessee, where it was on the campus of what was then Bethel College, now Bethel University. That move took place in an auspicious time uh, the summer of 1964, which was Freedom Summer. He was the first president of the seminary in Memphis. Along with other Cumberland Presbyterian visionaries, he saw the need for a seminary critically engaged with theological scholarship, deeply rooted in a life of faith, and committed to the well-being of people and the whole of God's creation. That is our three key values of scholarship, piety, and justice. Consistent with this vision, Bill Ingram and his faculty colleagues worked to create a seminary where people of different races, genders, social class, and faith traditions would come together for theological study in preparation for ministry, actively engaged in the church and the world. Tonight, continuing in the footsteps of Dr. and Mrs. Ingram, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Valerie Bridgman of the Methodist Theological School in Ohio for an evening of discussion on womanist work as relationship with nature. And now to introduce Dr. Bridgman, our Assistant Professor of Spiritual Formation and Director of Supervised Ministry, Dr. Christy Woodbury Moore. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gaffey. Dr. Valerie Bridgman is Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs as well as Associate Professor of Homiletics and Hebrew Bible at Methodist Theological School of Ohio. She also is founding president and CEO of Woman Preach Inc., the premier nonprofit organization that brings preachers to full prophetic voice. Some of her publications include Interpreting the Bible in the Age of Black Lives Matter, The Gideon Story, and Scholarly Commitments, and A Long Ways from Home, Displacement, lament and singing protest in Psalm 137. Dr. Bridgman currently is completing a commentary on Hosea with Dr. Cheryl Kirk Dugan. She also is co-editor of a volume on womanist methodology with Stephanie Buchanan Crowder under Fortress Press. Dr. Bridgman was inducted into the Society for the Study of Black Religion in 2007 and the Martin Luther King Jr. Collegium of Scholars and Preachers at Morehouse College in 2010. She also is an active member of the Society for Biblical Literature, where she currently serves on the Committee for Women in the Profession. Dr. Bridgman is a graduate of Baylor University with a PhD in Biblical Studies with a Hebrew Bible concentration. She is a peace activist and advocate for human rights. Welcome, Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman. You have the floor. Thank you. Um... Dr. Woodbury, 
more and uh, to all of you who are gathered here to uh, Dr. Gat Gatke, who is my dear friend. And um, I don't know what the word is for how we lament and both praise as deans. <laughs> it's good to have somebody to talk with. And to all of you who have joined us, I see former colleagues in the chat and former students. So it's good to be here with you all. Now I'm deeply aware that this is a lecture, but as people who've had me in class know, I hate lecturing. So what I'm gonna do, I hate lecturing. So what I'm gonna do is set, um, set the foundation for what I want us to talk about and then open the floor for us to talk together. You can ask me anything you want to. And I really believe in the phrase, I don't know. So if you ask me something that I don't know, that's what I'm gonna say, I don't know. So, okay, here we go. I've titled this, Hello Earth, Womanist Work as Relationship with Nature. And I wanna be real clear that I say as relationship with nature as opposed to creation, because I do think that as Christians sometimes we romanticize the word creation without thinking about what it really means to live in the earth, in the world, with all of the natural world that it is. So that's where the title comes from. It, it will be a conversation in dialogue with the Bible and with uh, womanist subjectivity. Womanist subjectivity here is, I'm using a phrase from Dr. Melanie um, Harris, who talks about an echo womanist, echo autobiography. So a lot of my own story will be in what I talk about tonight in an effort and an offering to ask you to bring your own story to the table. That too is womanist work. I'm gonna start with a song that many of you probably know that was written uh, in the late um, 1800s or uh, mid 1800s. Listen to the words of this song, for the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mal. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. This hymn written way back in the 1800s is in fact that of a, of a writer who is at all of creation, at all of nature around them and seeing the connection between creation and humans. We'll get back to that. I want to read you something I wrote. It is in relationship with my to my grandmother. My grandmother was a, was a National Baptist church mother. The black folk on here will know what I mean by a church mother. She was also a root worker, and it has always struck me that she did not see any contradiction between between being a church mother and a root worker. Hear these words, root mama. Every new moon, thin slice smiling sideways and looking down on her, every new moon found her walking toward the woods, mumbling mojo words, words we never learned, forgot to learn, words we didn't know at the time we needed. Every new moon, grand grand walked mumbling barely audible power words from some forgotten tribe of Africa, healing words, evil preventing words under her holy breath walking toward the woods. Every new moon, she left the house with a rag that was never washed that I can remember, a rag and a ragged edge knife for cutting roots, rooted exposure, rooted love, rooted health. Every new moon, mumbling, walking, cutting roots and blessing them for all our lives. Roots we never learned, 
forgot to learn roots we didn't know at the time we needed. And then I want to read for you one other thing. It is by Carol Lee Sanchez. The name of the piece is her song, and it actually is a song as well. She's here all around us. She is here deep inside us. She is here and everywhere. Weaver of galaxies and universe, she enfolds us, transforms us, and holds us. She is here all around us. She is here deep inside us. She is here and everywhere, birth mother of all heavens, birth mother of every star, birth mother of everything, life bringer, thought maker, song weaver, receiver of our dreams. She is here all around us, deep inside us. She is here and everywhere. These three pieces that I've read to you actually formed my thinking this night. Well as I was preparing for this night. How do you talk about the earth and whether or not we are actually related to it? How do we talk about what often is referred to as creation care or earth care without knowing that we are related to it and that earth itself, herself is more, is alive is more than dead matter, which oftentimes people seem to think of earth as. But if you've ever walked in the woods, ever encountered animals, ever hugged your own pet, you know that creation, nature is fully alive. This is what some people mean when they say, eat live food, eat raw food as live food. Because nature all around us, from earth, wind, fire, earth, wind, fire is alive, full of spirit, full of everything. Now, for some Christians, this is problematic because it, it reeks of panentheism. How dare you say that God is in the earth and part of the earth? And yet, if you read scripture closely, you will find that God gave birth to ice. God formed the mountains. In fact, it's called the mountain, El Shaddai, the breast of the earth. That's what the mountains are. That which gives nourishment, not just to human creatures, but to all creatures in the earth, all creatures, great and small. So as I talk about a womanist understanding of saying hello to the earth, I will say something I said in February when I spoke to Memphis Theological on a seminary Sunday about the four things that I think are non-negotiables. They are these, that if we are to talk about our relationship with the earth, we have to talk about what it means to have reciprocity. I'll come back to what these mean what it means to have respect for the earth, what it means to show restraint, and what it means to take responsibility. What I want to provide for you is this echo autobiography, how I came to care about the earth as more than an object, but as its own subject, is deeply tied first to my upbringing, then to my growing concern from what I see as human indifference to human destruction of the earth on which we depend, depend. Frankly, I see the race to space as an implicit acknowledgement that humans believe, at least some, that we're going to or have already used up the earth and need to conquer some other domain. This idea comes from our, what I think are our horrific notions of what the word dominion means in Genesis 2. And, and a dominating capitalistic colonizing view of those who have power to take it and do not see it as their responsibility to be in relationship with the earth and all its creatures. As problematic as the animated movie Pocahontas is, 
the song, The Colors of the Wind sticks with me. And I, and, and I want to share those words for you too. By now you figured out that one of the womanist ways is to use our art to help make our point. Pocahontas sings these words as she's walking along with John Smith. You think I'm an ignorant savage and you've been so many places, I guess it must be so, but still I can't see if the savage one is me. How can there be so much that you don't know? You think you own whatever land you land on. The earth is just a dead thing you claim, but I know every rock and tree and creature has a life has a spirit, has a name. You think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you. And if you've seen this movie, you'll remember that she's looking at, at a she bear with her cubs when she sings this part. But if you walk the footsteps of a stranger, you'll learn things you never knew you never knew. Have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn moon? or ask the grinning bobcat why he grinned? Can you sing with all the voices of the mountain? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? Come run the hidden pine, pine trails of the forest. Come taste the sun sweet berries of the earth. Come roll in all the riches all around you and for once never wonder what they are worth. The rainstorm and the river are my brothers. The heron and the otter are my friends. And we are all connected to each other in a circle, in a hoop that never ends. How high does the sycamore grow? If you cut it down, you'll never know. And you'll never hear the wolf cry to the blue corn moon for whether we're white or copper skinned. We need to sing with all the voices of the mountain. We need to paint with all the colors of the wind. You can own the earth and still all you own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. I recognize in this song, my own life because I am a daughter of the woods, of the creeks, of the trees of Alabama and frankly of every place I've ever lived this work has been my own since I was a child growing up on a farm in central Alabama. If you were with us in February, you will recognize some of what I'm gonna say here tonight. I grew up on a farm and consider myself a daughter of dirt more than dust and of spirit. I know the feel of bare feet on the ground and I know the earth as both friend and dangerous. I know it from the joy of eating wild plums, blackberries, and wild strawberries, and climbing trees to have to treat, and to have, and climbing trees. That's the friendship part. I know the danger of it from having to treat myself from fire ant stings, poison ivy, and poison oak, and snake bites, and also spider bites. The earth requires our respect. It is a first principle of womanist echo theological concerns and claims because the earth, as Alice Walker found out when she got Lyme disease, isn't only kind to us, it seeks to survive as well. Thus the danger that I talked about. But my grandfather would say, be careful as you go into the woods. He never said, don't go into the woods. He simply said, be careful. And he would say to us, if you hear a rattlesnake, be still. Now he required us to have a hole with us in case we ran into a poison snake so we could cut his head off. But he said, if you run into a rattlesnake, be still. It doesn't want to bite you. It just wants you to know it's there. Respect it. Give it time to get out of your way before you go on to what you were going to do. This connection between the earth, between creatures of the earth, is deeply womanist work. The connection between womanist and Black women's lives as a theological project was first addressed more significantly by Dr. Karen Baker Fletcher 
1998 when she wrote Sisters of Dust, Sisters of Spirit, Womanist Wordings on God and Creation. In her offering, she leads us into a conversation to really think about what it means to live on earth as in heaven. She connects for us Black women's healing practices, like the ones my grandmother had, as I read in the poem, Root Mama, what it means to be and love wildness, and what caring for creation as a principle means for us all. This book, unbeknown to me, was shaping my thinking around eco-womanism, which is more than care of creation, but it is also what it means to care to what it means, what a care is for what it means to be made in God's image, to be made of the same su substance as the stars, as India are saying. I am grateful for Dr. Baker Fletcher for reminding us that we are connected because we come from this dirt and because the God who created the dirt also created us. If we do not see ourselves connected in this way, we will always be destroyers and not caretakers. I am thankful for the specific work of Dr. Melanie Harris, who in 2017 wrote Echo Womanism, African-American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths. I recommend her foundational work as she lays out the ideas that lead us to earth honoring faith that calls us to environmental justice and sustainability as a part of womanist work. When I was in Brazil, Maval Jean Makota, who was a condomble priestess, said to us that we were paving over the medicines that we need, that we were destroying the earth in the name of getting ahead, and yet the earth heals us. And it is to our detriment if we forget that. It was Ma Valjeans who said to us, if you go into the woods and a plant grabs at you, stop, honor it, pay attention. It is probably the making of a tea or a healing poultice and just wants you to know that it's there. Growing up on that small farm that I did, it fed us and many others. We had a garden as well. And I can remember how sore my fingers got from shelling peas and husking corn, but also the joy I felt as people came to our garden and to our farm to get their own food to share with their neighbors. What we learned as farmers and as gardeners was there was more than enough if we were willing to share it. Ours was a small farm. My grandfather's campus, uh, Kempis McKinney's farm was a small farm, but his brother, my great uncle, Otho McKinney, had a 200 acre peach orchard in Clanton, Alabama that serviced all of central Alabama. And I can remember being in the peach orchards and reminding us and tasting the sweetness of those peaches and reminding myself that food is health. This is what Fannie Lou Hamer taught, us, Hamer taught us when she started the farm and the food uh, plan that she did in Mississippi, knowing that poor people needed to not only provide their own food, but provide for each other. So they would offer seeds to people who would plant a garden. And when the garden produced, she would ask people to bring seeds from the garden back so that other people would have seeds for the coming season and then to share their food. They had a pig farm as well so that those who needed the protein of meat would have pigs and chicken alike. We shared, she, she saw, said to us that we share a symbiotic relationship with the earth, with nature. We were careful on the farm that I grew up not to take what we did not need to tend to what we did have and to share what we had with our abund as abundance. My mother would say it this way, if I have a piece of bread, so do you. This ethic is the womanist way that takes into account that the earth has every seed bearing fruit and vegetable for human benefit, 
but only if we will tend the garden. That is what happens from the first beginning of the story we're given in Genesis 1. God creates everything that comes from the waters, everything that, that, that exists under the dome of the earth, creates even those things that we don't imagine, like great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. And the earth brings forth after every kind and after every seed. It is only after that, when God has said all of that is good, that God creates humans and tells them to care for what is created. We can only receive from the earth that which we are willing to take care of. Paying attention to nature, not just because of what it gives to humans, but because we are neighbor to all the earth's inhabits, inhabitants is womanist work. When the pandemic began and I decided to walk outside more rather than in a gym, I was greeted by a preponderance of er birds of the air and animals often relegated just to the woods or on the edge of the woods, deer, groundhog, coyote, rabbit, and more. They just began to show up in abundance as humans quieted down. It reminded me of when I was a child and would go into the woods behind our farm, careful to pay attention to where my foot landed so as not to unduly disturb a snake or some other animal that, that I did not want to disturb. And I would climb trees and wait for animals to accompany me. And they always came from the garter snakes that would wind their way up the tree to the fox that literally would sit at the, at the, at the root of the tree. As long as I sat still, the animals would come and they would sit until I was ready to leave. It felt and it still feels to me mystical, something I have never been able to explain that animals would come. Alice Walker would say they would come like the horses that came on her land outside of San Francisco because they knew I was a safe human. What would it mean for us if we decided that we were going to be a safe human? I am the daughter of the woods, a daughter of the woods. What God intends for us in this relationship as a daughter of the woods is reciprocity. We take only what we need. We give back in abundance. We do not take what we do not need. When my friend uh, said to me in the 1990s, we abuse the earth because we think of it as a woman. I was haunted by this statement. This is what Baker Fletcher makes mention of in her work, that much of the damage we do to the earth is because we think of the earth as woman. We damage women, we damage everything related to women. Ask yourself about that. Think about what it means that we are destructive to woman's spirit. And earth, Gaia, is ultimately the many-breasted one, mountains galore, a woman's spirit. The earth belongs to God, ultimately. The earth and everything in it, the world and all of its inhabitants, Psalm 24 says, God firmly established it on the waters. And then the psalmist says, all of that testifies to the glory of God. All creation gives a testimony to God's glory. It is womanist work to pay attention to the testimony that the earth is given. So poisonous water, poisoned water is flint is a testimony to human sin. Smog, air, wherever it is in China and in LA is a testimony to human sin. What would happen if we would take seriously and pay attention to the testimony around us and respond to it? I have always liked this, this saying 
attribute it to Chief Seattle, though I don't know that it is actually him. He said, would you teach your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother, that what befalls the earth befalls all the children of the earth? This we know, the earth does not belong to humans. Humans belong to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Humans did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. One thing we know, our God is also your God, he said. The earth is precious to your God. And to harm the earth is to heap contempt onto its creator. I would say to you that women, womanist scholars, echo womanists would agree with this statement that to heap, to harm the earth is to heap contempt on the earth's creator. I'll say that again. To harm the earth is to heap contempt onto the creator. Seattle went on to say, Chief Seattle went on to say, we're all children of the great spirit. We all belong to Mother Earth. Our planet is in great trouble. And if we keep carrying old grudges and do not work together, we will all die. 1800s, 2021, here we are. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. Take only memories, leave only footprints. In the midst of us reflecting on echo justice, what does it mean to live in right relationships with all creation, with all creatures and all and the planet? The earth's sorrows are imposing themselves on us. And creation is heaving, groaning for redemption. And despite sitting on my porch and staring into the trees out onto the farm where I live. I live on the campus. Our campus have a working farm. I can hardly think what, of what the wisdom is that we are to glean, except to continue to say, hello, earth. And the more you say hello to the earth, the more you pay attention to it. In Job 38, after Job has lamented before God and railed before God, God speaks out of the whirlwind, out from the storm. I grew up in Tornado Alley in Alabama, so this is a very vivid imagination for me about what it would mean to have this tornadic experience of God. For three chapters, God talks about creation. For three chapters in response to Job's suffering, God talks about creation. I wonder why, and I would ask you to wonder why. Because one of the first things that says, who has the wisdom to count the clouds? God is asking Job to put his suffering in context. I am not dismissing Job's suffering as I'm thinking a lot about it these days, but that question too haunts me. I remember when I was six or seven, I had not, I grew up in these woods, listening to the wind, waiting on it to blow the warmth of the sun into my face watching the animals form in the clouds. And they always do. They always do. It was a ritual to watch the crowds, clouds rather, knowing they could not be counted. I have been for all these years trying to figure out what it means for us to count the clouds now, to take into account the damage we have done to our atmosphere, earth, wind, and 
to see the earth on fire from volcanic eruptions and wildfires. Can you see it? What it means if we don't start thinking about what it means to pay attention to the clouds that provide us water if we treat the earth correctly, but does not if we don't. Going back to, to uh, Job, when I was growing up, one of my favorite Negro spirituals was this. Over my head, I hear music in the air. That must be a God somewhere. Job 38 says that God asked, on what were its footings set, the earth? Or who laid its corner, cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. I was 25, traveling across country on a Greyhound bus from Texas to Tacoma, Washington to see my older sister get married. I had my two-year-old and four-year-old in tow with all the requisite toys, blankets, and snacks. We survived the trek without inc incidents. On the way back, we took the Amtrak down from Tacoma to Los Angeles and got stuck on the track because of an earthquake stalled between the Pacific Ocean on our right and the Sierra Mountains on our left, we sat. As we sat, a hush began to ascend, descend. There were sighs and awes as people looked at the oceans and the mountains and over the ocean, out in the middle of nowhere, the skies expanse sprinkled and twinkled with stars looked like they were in the ocean. You could make out the constellations. On the surface of the ocean, people began to think. I start thinking of the song, Stand By Me. The second verse, it says, that the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall and the mountain should crumble in the sea. I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear as long as you stand by me. It was as if the stars had stumbled or uh, tumbled into the sea and the snow topped mountains, snow capped mountains were singing back. The icy shine of the moon's reflected light. And I thought of another song that you will recognize. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds your hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And this is a song that is over our heads. This is the song of the God that is somewhere. This is the God who we don't know, <laughs> but gave birth to the rain, and to the drops of dew, whose womb formed the ice and gave birth to the frost from heavens. Again, from Job 38. When waters and the deep froze, who bind the chains of the, of the, the stars, Orion's belt, the Pleiades, the constellations in their seasons, can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Finding humility in the presence of, of creation, a disrupted trip brought the wisdom of creation. We cannot bind together the Pleiades or loosen Orion's belt. We may know something of the mystery, but it should bring us to humility and to restraint. With all of our conqueror's mentality, there are places that should be off limits to us. And we should make it off limits to ourselves. Finally, I think about Harriet Tubman when she served the Union soldiers and they were suffering from dysentery. According to the biography of her life, she would go into the fields wherever the, the soldiers were camping 
and find plants that would heal them who had suddenly become sick. We learned that she nursed the soldiers in the hospitals and knew how when they were dying by numbers of some malignant disease with cunning skill to extract from roots and herbs which grew near the source of the disease, the healing draught which allayed the fever and restored them to health. This is what the earth offers us if we will restrain ourselves from destroying it. If we will agree to being a caretaker and not a destroyer. If we will reciprocate care for what it gives us and give back in a way that nurtures it. If we will be responsible and take only what we need and nothing more. This is what it means to say hello to earth and to think about the world from a womanist echo autobiography. Thank you. So I'm just, I guess I'm just going to take the questions as they come. I didn't know if somebody was going to say something, but I see a question from Donna Van Hook who says, in womanist work, how do I make the connection of echo womanist with environmental injustice, for lack of a better term, using a racial equity lens? Well, first of all, Donna, thank you for the question. And secondly, I would just say that womanist, echo womanism is uh, social justice, is justice work. I mean, that's the very point that um, we, do, we don't just notice the earth, but we defend it and we do the kinds of work that takes care of it. Um, that is the lens you're at. I forget how you asked the question. Let me go back to the question. You asked the question as, as a racial equity lens. Well, woman, womanist is black is, uh, you know, womanist is to feminist what purple is to lavender. So womanist work is black womanist feminist justice work. And here, particularly looking at Baker Fletcher and Harrison's work is the work that we have around uh, uh, ecological justice. I also think it allows for echo uh, hermeneutics to read the Bible in such a way that you actually see the earth that's in the Bible, as opposed to reading the Bible as human first thinking. If you, if you actually read the Bible, you don't even see that. Thank you, Valerie. I'm, Dr. Bridgman, I'm going to um, just encourage folks who are um, coming on right now and see them in the gallery of faces uh, to feel free to ask questions. Um, I think we can have kind of an open discussion here. Dr. Bridgman, thank you so much for your offering on tonight. I've gleaned so much from you and just appreciate the time uh, to sit with you as well. I did have a question following up on one statement that you said. You said that you're a daughter of dirt more than of dust. And immediately I thought, I guess you had to come to that understanding more than just the agrarian context of which you grew up on, right? You said you grew up on a farm. Um, so it was more than a ascribed circumstance of your upbringing, but could you explain a little bit more or share how you came to that identity and the lasting theological implications perhaps it now has on your personal life? Uh, two, thank you, Sydney, for the question. Two things come to mind. One is that I was thinking about James Wells and Johnson's uh, creation poem, you know, God molded us out of dirt, you know, the same thing as in Genesis you know, God created us out of dirt. And I think because you can't grow anything in dust, the things that grow are grown in dirt, right? The things that are fertilized are fertilized in dirt. 
And so that's why I choose dirt. The theological implications for me is that that makes me even more connected to, to the created order, right? To nature. Uh, I, I really, I think it, her name is Sheree Mariaga. I really um, want us, whether we grew up agrarian or not. So I wanna really address that part because I have a friend who grew up in the city who said, I don't know anything about nature. And I said, but you live near Central Park. What are you talking about? I've been to Central Park. It's a huge place. Oh, I never think about it as, as nature, but it is, you know? So there are all these places that we ignore as nature, as requiring dirt to grow. But even, you may remember um, the song, There's a Rose in Spanish Harlem. In the song, the rose comes through the crack. It makes me think about this, about uh, Jurassic Park where the scientist always says, life always finds a way. And my point is we don't pay attention to nature, whether we're in the city or in the country, because we don't think about it as connected to our own lives. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my answer. If you have further questions, you can ask. You certainly did. Thank you so much for just sharing um, what's on your mind and your lived experience as well. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Bridgman. Thank you so much for what you shared, just everything about how you shared when you were growing up and just how vivid the imagery is. And I was just really taken by that. And I wonder um, if you could speak to any experience that you may have had growing up with making mud pies. So as you were talking about, um, in response to, to what Sydney asked, as you were talking about dirt that made me think of mud pies. And so is there, is there any experience that, that you can share about mud pies and what that connection to the land feels like? So, so I grew up, I don't, I'm a woman of a certain age. So in the summertime, we would get put out the house and you couldn't come back. You know, you did your, your, you did your farm chores in the morning, you ate a hearty breakfast and you might come back and have a sandwich for lunch, but you were expected to be out all day. And so we were riding our bicycles or playing in the woods, you know, something. So we became intimate friends with the woods and, and knowing what it was. And there was a creek nearby. So yes, we made mud pies. And if I tell the whole truth, we ate dirt. <laughs> if I tell the whole truth, while we were also drinking uh, or drinking the nectar out of honeysuckles and, and the whole, whole like, part of what I think, you know, I was struck by the fact that I was having a conversation with my daughter, my, my granddaughter, that, that food doesn't come from the grocery store. Like food comes from the earth. And yes, it gets delivered to the grocery store and that may be where you buy it, you know. I, I used to fish, but my way of fishing now is to go to the grocery store. <laughs> you know, I, I fish in the grocery store now. But, but I know that, I know that the grocery store is not where fish come from. So I think some of the, some of what I would want for us uh, I saw I saw another question in the Q and A. Some of what I would want for us is to to um, to experience the earth, to connect with it. I mean, don't all of us live near a park? You know, if nothing else, don't we all live near a park? Um, aren't there weeds around our houses? or around their apartments? Can we just pay attention? This is what, what you know, and when the proverb says, go pay attention to the ant, go pay, go pay attention to, to the uh, grasshopper, but also pay attention to the plants. What can they teach you? What can you learn from paying attention? It'll certainly help your preaching if you pay attention. Um, Ellen Davis in her book about the, the agrarian Bible, you know, talks, 
talks about the fact that we preach the Bible as if it's not in the agrarian world. That alone means that we need to pay attention to the earth around us. Um, the, the question that caught my attention was from Makisha Scott. Hi, Makisha, good to see you here. <laughs> uh, how to bring this work to the local congregational level so with so much of the environmental conversation being thought of as a macro level concept. Okay, so um, my one of my friends who uh, lives in Colorado and worries about the rivers in Colorado, you have to worry about water as much as you wor worry about dirt and plants. You just have to. We, we need a functioning environment, right? Uh, but one of the things he says is, you can't do everything, but you can do something. That, you know, he's quoting Mother Teresa. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And I think a lot of times we, we think, oh my God, I can't solve the climate problem. So I'm not gonna do anything. Well, you know, I'm thinking about Hebrew Brown III. You probably know his work with the Black Church um, Food Security Network. Like start a garden at your church on your church lawn. Start there. Uh, uh, build a um, uh, um, environment, you know, that allows for the creatures that will will. Um, I'm trying to think of the word that it's called. Oh, you know, like a butterfly garden, butterfly and bee garden, because they will help the environment. You know, get earthworms enrich the earth around you build you know there was a time when kids build these things but because we think technology is important if we haven't learned anything this last couple of years we've learned technology is good until it's not and it's certainly not mental health technology is not um so i so an answer markeisha to where you start start small I mean, literally start with a hello earth and pay attention. Learn when the earth turns to learn when the sun, when the moon is a new moon or when it's a full moon, go stand under the full moon and pay attention. Like literally one of my favorite songs I use it in almost everything I say is from Sister Act. If you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. You know, pay attention. That so anyway, that's my response. Again, don't know if it's a good answer, but it is my answer. Um, there's a question here. I'm a I'm gonna try to read it through. Oh, about our God language with regard to seeing being destructive to the earth because of the way we talk about it as as a woman, and that brings to to account uh, of God language. Well, you know, I will, again, I'll quote myself in an essay I wrote some years back. I, I started the essay with everything you say about God is a lie. Everything. There's no human language that can capture God. So, so our language should become expansive. Plus the Bible is full of expansive language about God. The one who gave birth to ice, the midwife in Psalm 22, God of the mountains, literally mean, meaning breast, the many breasted one. That's still gendered language, but rock of ages is not. You get what I'm saying? My, what I'm trying to say is, um, a lot of times people say, oh, my church won't take that. You, I can't say that in my church. I'm like, how do you know? You haven't tried. You haven't introduced them to this expansive, loving God who cannot be contained by human language. And therefore we should expand our language. And I do think by expanding our language uh, around God, it will help us pay attention to what we are saying and doing to the earth, uh, to all of creation, not just the earth, to the ozone, 
to space. I mean, the amount of trash that is in space right now because of our satellites and our, again, this is human hubris, right? I'm not saying we should not explore space. I, I, you know, maybe God made us explorers. But, but I, do, I do think that there's a problem when we are so interested in space that we allow people to die because we won't take care of Earth. One of my favorite sayings, if you've heard me ever before, I've said this before too, it's a Haitian uh, proverb, God gives, but God does not share. It's their way of saying the earth is full. Everything we need is in it. Everything we need as humans is in it. But because we are takers and not sharers, there are people who have and people who don't have. Not because there's not enough, but because of the way we uh, organize our lives. Again, I don't know if that answers, but that's my answer. Uh, Aaron Dennis, let me see if I can read fast enough to see what the question is. Oh, embody, embodied uh, expressions of intimacy with nature. Um, you know, uh, Native, Native Americans, uh, uh, natives to Turtle Idol Island, uh, my friends, who are indigenous to this culture, these cultures. Um, you know, I talked about sitting in trees. I talked about walking barefoot. I would talk about warming my hands to a fire. I think you should have a fire pit out sometimes. I, I would talk about eating fresh food, like straight off the tree, plum tree, uh, or, or, a strawberry. Now that presumes you can find a farm where they will let you do that, or you have one yourself, a garden yourself. Um, I think taking your time to eat your food even, and to think about where it came from, and how it got to your table, is a central, intimate way of connecting to nature and to creation, and our kinship. Because something had to die for you to eat it, right? And a colleague of mine who's native um, to this island, uh, you always bless the animal that you ate. You, you honor that blood was spilt on your behalf. You honor that. So, okay, that's my answer, Aaron. Again, don't know if that's the, an answer, but that is. Um, so Carlette, how Carlette had a question. Did you still have your question, Carlette? I do. Uh, it, it plays a little bit off of the last one. Hello, my name's Colette. Hi. So glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> when you said we take from the earth because we think <laughs> because we think of it as woman, and historically as well as today, kind of what is going on. And obviously, I'm not going to touch on politics, but what is going on just in this way that we've kind of taken two steps back with women um, being, having full rights as our own human. Um, how, wh what are ways that you draw on to sustain hope in, in the dark periods? Yeah. I'm probably not the person to answer that <laughs> question. I, I despair more than I hope, but Bishop Yvette Flunder often says, uh, she's the prelate, uh, presiding prelate for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a uh, queer woman, uh, Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, who's been doing this work for over 30 years says, we are obligated to hope. And that what we see as, as loss, that God is still responding to our faithfulness. So our, our role is to be as faithful as we can. Um, if, if we think the, the goal is to win, we're gonna always be despairing. But if the goal is to be faithful and in full relationship with God and all of God's creation, we can do that, right? 
So part of how I keep my sanity is I walk every day. And I walk the, I walk, I walk the farm. Yes, but also there are the, the gift of central Ohio is that there are several nature parks. I can just disappear into the woods, um, trails, wooded trails, and, and, and commune with nature and therefore with nature's God. All creatures great and small, the earth and all creation. So yeah. Uh, Christy, shall I go back to questions in the Q&A? Absolutely. Okay. Ruth, it's good to see your name here. Wow, throwback to my time. How do we respond to Christians who say that God would give us a new heaven and earth, new earth so we don't have to worry about this one? Yeah, that's the ever ongoing. I get that question every time, some, every time I talk about the nature. I'm like, how can you say, um, I, I don't understand people who, whose theology allows them to be that destructive to people and to nature in the name of God. Um, Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field. Learn from the raven. I'm like, how are you going to do that if you're destroying it? Uh, that's the Jesus you say you love. Because you're going to get a new heaven and a new earth don't mean you should destroy this one to hasten it. Especially since Jesus said no one can know the day or the hour. And we should remind ourselves of that as often as we can. No one knows the day or the hour. I actually don't ever try to answer that question, Ruth, for people. I kind of shake my head and go, the earth is in trouble because of people like you. <laughs> and try not to say that out loud. So usually I say, God bless you and uh, keep moving. So the question from Milo Lumpkin, so Ruth, I don't know if that answers, but that's my answer. How can an echo womanist theology be used in the Miso Dei and evangelism due to the unrestrained consumerism of our country? Do you think this should be one of the most important missions of the church? And the answer is yes, I do think this should be one of the most important missions of the church. It makes me think of um, uh, Wangari Matai who won the Nobel Peace Prize, oh, late 90s, I believe, uh, from Kenya who in order to, to save their uh, their ecological their country from ecological degradation started planting trees. It was also an economic decision she made, and the, and they laughed at her, but the women started planting trees. Pay attention to what I'm saying to stop erosion, to provide resources for them, fire, uh, wood uh, for the use for cooking, and of course, if you know anything about trees and all the plants that grow around trees, once you have a good canopy over them and literally say, help to save um, uh, Kenya. What I would say as, as Christians, because we're supposed to, according to Acts 2, those who have are supposed to share so that those that don't have also have what they need. So nobody have too much and nobody lacks anything. That's a Christian principle. I know people think that's a socialist principle. So maybe it is, maybe it's a Christian socialist principle. If we actually share the way the biblical text calls us to, that would also mean taking care of and not dumping our garbage uh, in the ocean, in the backyards of poor people who are usually people of color that often cause asthma and other um, ongoing medical issues. I think the church ought to take it up in where they live. Here, um, we have several uh, churches that grow, that have, a, have a, a, a garden for the people, not just that go to their church, but live in their neighborhoods and help in that way. So I, I actually think, yeah, the church ought to take that up. That was a long way to yes, but yes. 
So the question about ethical, uh, eco womanist thought and eth ethical veganism. Let me just say, I'm not a vegan, though I eat vegan and vegetarian a lot. And I will say that I have not done a lot of work on veganism, but I do know that Christopher Carter and, oh Lord, her name just went out of my mind, the womanist who is doing uh, ethical veganism um, have made these connections of the abuse of animals uh, connected to abuse to black and brown bodies. And so I, that's all I can say about that, Josh. I don't have any other answer than what I just said. So there are some connections in some writings. And I, I would imagine there will be more as this deepens. So uh, Kenya Gray is asking me, will I expound on the quote, we abuse the earth because we think of it as a woman. <laughs> oh God. Um, so when Lynn, my friend Lynn said this to me, we were, we were in Texas, we were on uh, Texas Impact. So we were trying to get the government of Texas to pay attention to these kinds of issues ecological degradation, environmental uh, racism and the like. And she, she made that statement. As long as people think that they can use women's bodies, that women's bodies are objects for the use of men, that women have no say so, back to what Colette was asking, no say so over their own bodies and therefore no, no agency then we think of the earth as having no agency and no integrity and needing, because we think that about women, right? Uh, and if you say mother earth, it's very interesting. Some of, some of the worst people around this degradation would tell you they love their mothers and their daughters and their wives. But what you find out is those are the only women they love are their mothers, their wives, their children. The rest of us can literally go to hell as far as they're concerned or do what they say, whatever that means. Uh, it's very interesting hearing a woman say that a woman shouldn't lead because she has menstrual cycles and they get, they get um, women get emotional when they're bleeding. And I'm like, but, Women are not causing wars. So who's getting emotional? Okay, enough of that. Uh, how we can change that perspective is to live it our day by day, to challenge it when we hear it in our neighbors and our friends, to challenge it in ourselves when, when we see ourselves doing it and go from that. Okay, now Donna Van Hook is wanting me to talk to, to talk about Jesus cursing the fig tree. Uh, because I wasn't prepared to do a Bible study, Donna, I will just say this. I don't remember the context of that except for the fig tree had, was not blossoming as Zephaniah would say, there was no fruit on its vine. That in the time when it was supposed to, uh, Phyllis Tripper would probably say the curse of the fig tree is a, is, a, is a description and not a prescription. That what Jesus is saying is that the fig tree is cursed because it's not producing in its time and not that Jesus said, you're not gonna produce. If you remember the text, it wasn't, there was no production at a time when it should have been producing. Now, the question would be why in a time, what was going on? Was there, was there a drought? Was there, what was going on that in a time when something should be producing, it didn't produce? Uh, our farmers, this year, our farm did 30,000, 31,000 pounds of food during the growing season, down from 75,000 last year. And it was directly related to the, to the climate. 
which also means that it drove certain animals, certain insects into the fields that wouldn't have been, been in the fields had it not been for the climate. So the warming climate find certain um, uh, insects, certain predators uh, that wouldn't be in certain places in places that we wouldn't expect them. The rising seas is destroying um, fish as they try to make their way up channels. You know, I think the thing we have to ask ourselves is how much are we uh, responsible for that kind of damage? Again, I don't know if that actually answers your question, but that's my answer. Dr. Bridgman, I want to give you every opportunity that you will take now to uh, talk about how toxic masculinity is revealed and exposed um, and critiqued by what you've talked about tonight. Yeah. Oh, Lord have mercy. You got a couple hours? Um, so I think we throw these terms around and then they mean nothing to people. So um, for those who have heard the term toxic masculinity and think, oh, now you just hate men, all men. No, there's a kind of... of um, brute force masculinity that takes dominion as the ultimate goal to become the king of the heat. You will remember in 1 Samuel that God never intended for ancient Israel to have a king. And that the prophet said, this is what's going to be like if you get a king, you know, and all the stuff you're going to, your children are going to go, go into slavery, you're going to get in debt, you know, you're going to have to give a portion of your crops, you know, the whole drill, because that's what happens when, when, and, and toxic masculinity grows from that kind of dominionist thinking, right? Somebody has to be in charge. We have no, the, the notion of consensus living, which many indigenous people, uh, one, I, I was listening to a podcast uh, from Scene on radio, uh, S-C-E-N-E -E, on radio. Uh, and they were talking about how when the European settlers met some of the native tribes, they were angry because the council was always the wise women from the tribes in the area, uh, not, the, not the chiefs, you would think. And they had to govern by consensus. And it would take them months to come to a decision when the Europeans was used to the king making a decree. I mean, this is the problem with tech, toxic masculinity. People want somebody to, quote, make a decision as opposed to waiting on a decision that is beneficial for everyone involved or working together in such a way that everyone benefits and not just the people with the biggest um, muscles or the biggest pocket. But I had something else in my mind. Y'all saw me fix my face. Yeah. Um, again, how do we how do we get beyond that? I I, I had a, a male friend say to me, "Well, men have to give up too much." I'm like, "Really? That's your answer?" It's dangerous to all of us. Racism is danger to all of us. Toxic masculinity is dangerous to all of us. The patriarchy kills everybody. Nobody gets to enjoy the benefits of mutuality, of reciprocity, when you insist that somebody has to dominate. I, and the only thing I can say is try it. Do it in small communities. Become an, uh, and become a community that testifies against the degradation. Live in community with people who would would choose a different way of living, even if it takes a month to make a decision. Yeah, that's what I have to say about that, Nathan. I have a 
question, Dr. Bridgman. Um, and this is just off the top of my head. I used to work in corporate America where um, I did a lot of work with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And of course, that's, that's still a big corporation, right? Um, I'm just wondering your thoughts on any of the work that they say they're doing <laughs> or, or um, the, the, are they really doing the work? Um, you know, we like to leave it up to them. The, the EPA will handle big corporations who have plants and manufacturing facilities. They'll handle all of that. They have regulations. Uh, but oftentimes we find that, that there is lacking. There's something lacking or there's something that's happening under the table that allows them to turn, turn their face away. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on um, the work that we think they're doing and the fact that we have to continue to do work because of what they may not be doing. So probably not a good answer, especially since it's being recorded, but I don't trust any government to do what it says it's doing because what's being, what's being attended to is the benefit of the wealthiest and richest. And if it's beneficial to them to drop a crumb here, they are for, for the poorest and the most vulnerable among us, they'll do that. But it's, this is what I think Jesus meant by, it's hard for a rich man to make it into heaven <laughs> because of the commitment to, and the, the commitment to wealth, right? To owning to being in charge, to having everything. And the EPA is subject to that as well. You know, we, I know we don't quote vote that person in, but we vote in the person that's gonna name that group. Um, you know, and, and as long as, as there is no value placed when business people are in charge, I don't, I, this is a blanket statement. I know this is not true. So I'm not saying all whatever. So don't anybody ding me about that. But on the whole, when business people are in charge, they are as the song, the colors of the wind, they're thinking about what they can own, what they can possess. The fact that we pay for water the fact that that Flint is on a fresh lake water and they, because that water rights have been given to a corporation, that we then had to buy their water to send the people in Flint, that they got out of the lake right up from Flint. I, I don't, it boggles my mind. And as, as a womanist, I would say it is an ultimate sin. I think we have to learn to call these things sin. So as to holding the EPA or anybody else accountable, you know, if, if you're called to that kind of activism, by all means do it. And at the same time, I'm voting for build a community that will stand in opposition to all of this destruction. And I do mean a community because I think one of the challenges in Christianity as it is, is practiced in the US and beyond is that um, we often think about Christianity as individualistic. But literally salvation in the biblical text is, um, communal. Almost every you is plural. But because we have bought into a kind of you, your personal, you and Jesus salvation. Okay, I have my own personal relationship with Jesus. Let somebody want to say something about that. But you can't have a relationship with Jesus without other people. And I would dare say without the earth. Because all creation is groaning for the children of God to show up. 2 Corinthians 5 says, groaning for redemption. So build the communities 
that will be themselves a testimony against the degradation. You know, I think about the work that Heber Brown is doing, and frankly, I hate to give him props since he's on here, but I am. And the work that uh, Dr. O'Fish is doing, you know, it's like the work is communal. You can't do activism. You can't grow crops. You can't build networks by yourself. You can't. You need a community. I was joking about not wanting to give him props. I appreciate the work that you're doing. So, so I think from a from a echo womanist point of view, when I say say hello Earth, it's not just me personally communing with Earth. When I am out walking by myself, I am aware that I am in relationship. We just came through All Saints Day. I am in relationship with that great cloud of witnesses, with my ancestors who taught me how to plant. You know, I was going to plant a garden and then I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Everybody around me has a plot and I live on a farm. So I just got the stuff from the farm and the extra beans and whatever the other people had planted that they knew because the people always plant too much. They always plant more than they can use. So, you know, share, 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 share. Build community, build community. You know, um, uh, a colleague of mine was like, why does everybody have to have washer and dryer? Why? Why don't we wash our clothes together? And I was like, well, that's a bridge too far. But I get her point, right? You know, maybe that's not a bridge too far. Maybe we have just been individualized so much that we don't know what community really means. Yes, the barter economy. And not even barter as much as the sharing economy. You know, what would happen if literally we believed the Bible? <laughs> X2. If we actually believed it, what would that be? And this, yeah. this is something, uh, Dr. Bridgman, that I think we could talk some about or ask you to talk a little bit about the role of the church in encouraging that kind of sharing. So, you know, the, thinking about the doing of laundry, um, there are laundromats that a lot of people use, um, people who don't have, don't have the ability uh, because they don't have the money to uh, buy a washer and a dryer uh, quite often. Uh, but what if a church opened up a basement and it says it's a laundromat and it's free uh, for whoever wants to come. And the great thing about a laundromat is that it creates community, right? You get to meet people, you talk with folks. Um, and I don't, you know, romanticize it because there's some nasty things about laundromats sometimes too, but, uh, you know, in a church setting, maybe it could really be a great place for community, uh, or have a church that has a, um, you know, it has five lawnmowers, electric lawnmowers that people right. can, you know, rent out. So, what do you think about the role of the church? I know you, there's a program at, at, at your school that's encouraging people to connect with the land. And of course, we have the, the DMIN and land, food, and faith formation. And so what is the role of the church here? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we, you know, we're trying to do, and, and I'm, I'm really happy to watch some of our recent alums try to put this in practice up in East Ohio is this whole thing of connected relationship because oftentimes people go into their church as the pastor and have no relationship with any other congregation. So uh, when I was a pastor in Austin, we didn't have a food pantry or a clothes closet because every church around us had a food pantry and a clothes closet. I was like, volunteer with them. They need help. Don't go build something just because just to say you've done it. What would happen if we actually collaborated with the body of Christ across denominations, across theological aims, and then provided in the area where we are? And I mean, Nathan put, what if food was free? <laughs> what if, what if, you know, what if I, I think about my grandmother used they and how they used to have quilting bees. 
And by the winter, everybody had a new quilt because eight or nine people had sat around a horse, the quilting horses, brought their scraps and quilted quilts for everybody. So no one person is worried about whether they're gonna have a warm quilt for their family. My point is, uh, and I, Willie Jennings kind of gets to this, is our lack of imagination is killing us as much as our lack of money. It's like, what, what or more? What, what if we, what if we got in the room with a bunch of folk and said, let's not th talk theology, let's talk need and how we're going to mitigate. Now, our theologies will come out of that, but, you know, our, our to our own detriment, I imagine, but I, I think the church, here's what I think. I think the church often tries to do too much as opposed to doing a significant thing. So I'm going to give you an example. I was doing some mentoring with a congregation in Atlanta, and I asked them to lay out all the church's ministries for me, Very a fairly small congregation. I was exhausted reading the list of the things they said they were doing. So then I said, well, how many of these things are you doing well? And then I said, what if you cut back to just three of these things? And then you found out how much of that was about people's egos. So the question about what can the church do to help be in better relationship with, with um, nature and each other is find the one thing you can perfect and do well and do that and bring people on with you and do it in a way that, um, that invites the people to participate and not just this same congregation I said to them, I want y'all to fast from titles. Don't call anybody by their title. And then let's see if they actually are a deacon or a, you know, whatever the title somebody was carrying by what they do. You know, this is the James Jamesian theology, right? You show me your faith by, I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead, being by itself. Um, but I think if a, if a local congregation will, and, and I think the other thing that often happens is churches will say, if everybody can't sign on, then we can't do anything. Ah, if you got 10 folk who want to do it, let them do it. They will invite and invoke and provoke the other people to join them. We provoke one another to love and good works. I mean, we provoke one another to that. But we can't do that if we're not doing it. If we're just wringing our hands about what we can't get done because the work is too big. Uh, was it Danielle, um, Danny Bell? Oh, a crouch that says little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. You know, take your little. If, if, if you're trying to get famous and cookies for doing ecological work, then you're going to get tired quick. I farmed. It's not pretty. You get stung by bees, bitten by spiders, <laughs> uh, scratched up by weeds, the whole nine yards. It's not pretty work. And so I think that's the other piece. It's certainly one of the things that Melanie Harrison points out in her, her work around uh, echo womanism, which is it's not pretty work, it's meaningful work. And if you're the, I don't want to get my hands dirty kind of person, then this work will never get done. Oh, my friend, Ashan is here. Hi, Ashan. I just say, say your name. Nobody needs to know. <laughs> is there more? 
Now, I was under the impression we were through at 8.30, my time, 7.30, your time, but yeah, I got that, time. I was just going to jump in and say, I think we have, we have reached the end of our, our designated meeting time. Um, I want to just thank you, Dr. Bridgman, so much for, um, this was, it was a kind of meditative talk. Um, and, and part of that was the, the poetry, the music, but also your spirit which is uh, a dirty spirit. <laughs> Such, and I'm saying that in a good way. Oh, I like that. Yep. Um, so I, I thank you so much for, for, the, uh, for your presentation, but also the engagement in the questions uh, that we have. I think we have a lot of food for not only thought, uh, but for our bellies and for our actions. And, um, and now we're going to end with prayer. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bridgman. Um, you reminded me of honeysuckles, love bugs, and mud pies. Um, and so you um, brought, took me back to my childhood days, and I feel really warm and fuzzy inside and just remembering that. So for that, I absolutely thank you. Let us all bow for a word of prayer. God, how we thank you for what we've experienced tonight. We are so grateful for the work of Dr. Bridgman. We thank you, God, for what she has shared, the insights and revelation she has given to us. Now, God, we confess that so often we are really in a transactional relationship with the earth, that we are destroyers, we are takers, and we often see the earth as an object and not subject. And so tonight, our prayer is that you might reorient us, that you might reintroduce us to the earth, that you might teach us and show us, oh God, that the earth is indeed alive, and is in need of our care and nurture. We praise you for all that are that are on this call and all that you have imparted. It is in your son, Jesus, who is the Christ, we do pray. Amen and good night. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thanks all. Good night. Good night, thank everybody. You. And thank you again for the invitation. Absolutely.